Thank you for joining us online and thank you for joining us in person. Uh, I'm Spiros Maniatis, I'm the director of uh, the Bridges Institute. Uh, I'm here just to uh, welcome uh, an old friend who will be chairing this panel. Uh, Alex uh, is uh, an expert in the field. Uh, uh, he, I would almost call him an intellectual influencer uh, in, in this field. <laughs> he has thousands of followers on Twitter uh, and we go back uh, a long time with Alex because seven, eight years ago, uh, we started a program on art and the law uh, in my previous uh, uh, job at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary. The project, the program is thriving, uh, but I, I, I'm delighted to welcome him at the Institute. This is a fascinating uh, project from the Institute's perspective because the, uh, it, has, it will have a lot of impacts. Uh, the outputs are uh, quite imaginative. Uh, I think groundbreaking, it's not dry at all. Uh, it's uh, one of the most uh, fascinating projects that we had developed and the Institute. So I'm delighted to welcome Alex that will lead this conversation. Thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you very much, Spiros. It's wonderful to see you. And you were instrumental in helping us start up the Art Business and Law program when it was in its infancy, and it's now going into its seventh year. So we're, we're very grateful for all that you did um, at CCLS, and it's great to see you here at Bickle. Next, we will turn to this fascinating research project called Beyond Restitution, exploring the story of cultural objects after repatriation which was put together by researchers here at Bickle. The project is funded by the Leverhulme Trust, and it looks at museums, communities, families, a considerable time after an artifact or group of artifacts has been returned. The idea here is to form a better understanding of the often forgotten side of return. What is its purpose? And does it actually serve such a purpose in practice? When I first learned about this project, which was during the pandemic, I thought, my goodness, I wish I had thought of that. When we look at restitution cases, we're often left to hypothesize about what has transpired since. Was it of material, cultural, or spiritual benefit to the receiving community, family, or nation? In some ways, the arguments for restitution or against restitution often rely on this very hypothetical outcome. Now, thanks to this project, we will soon have valuable evidence that we can assess in order to have these debates going forward. Because we're at Bickle, this is more than an anthropological study. It will need to consider the impacts, if any, on law and policy as well. Many of us have seen the recent controversy relating to Benin bronzes being returned to Nigeria. As some of you know, the outgoing president of Nigeria declared that title and custody in the bronzes would be vested in the traditional ruler of the kingdom of Benin. I won't get into the details on that, but it's something that's very topical. What impact might this have on Western museums deciding to return pieces in the future? Should it matter in relation to those items already returned? And what does it mean for the partnerships already in place, especially those that relate to loan back arrangements and the financing of a new museum that would display returned objects in Nigeria? No simple answers to those questions. And perhaps wisely, this research project has not used the Benin bronzes as a case study. So we won't get into that today, but it was just brought up as a, an example of something very current where people are tackling some of these issues about what to do after artifacts have been returned. The project's findings and recommendations when they come later this year will no doubt strengthen our understanding of the area. If we sometimes look at artifacts or artworks and their afterlives, that is the time following their creation and traditional use, and at times their removal from a location and placement in a museum or in a private collection, then this project will add a valuable chapter to that story, a period we can perhaps call the after afterlife. So we look forward to hearing about this, the after afterlife today, and eventually re reading about it in the report that will be issued later this year. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the project leader, Kristen Hausler. 
Kristen is Dorset Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for International Law here at Bickle. She has great expertise in cultural heritage law and human rights. She's spoken on cultural heritage matters around the globe, including at the UN, NATO, many universities. And before joining the Institute, she worked at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, Canada, a place we both know quite well, and worked on repatriation of ancestral remains to indigenous communities. So the perfect person to be leading this project is Kristen Hausler. Thank you very much. I um, will just maybe need some help because my slides are just going to be uh, going back. It's the very last one. So. Okay. Um, so, Thank you very much for your help. Thank you all for coming here and thank you for uh, those uh, listening in online. Uh, it's, uh, I have the great pleasure to be uh, the first uh, presenter today and I'll try to give you a bit of an overview uh, of the project and also of some of our preliminary uh, findings. Um, and I hope that you will bear in mind some of those thoughts, some of those, those points we have uh, come up with so far during our research during uh, the other presentation that we will uh, hear uh, today. So the subtitle of our project Beyond Restitution is exploring the story of cultural objects after their repatriation. And I wanted to hear with my first slide to uh, give a nod to quite a few of the people that I have met uh, throughout the field work that I conducted for the project. This is to say that the story of cultural object is really also the story of people. So I think it's, in, it's good to keep in mind that all of these objects are tied to different people who have different interests uh, and perspective on them. So here are just a few of them I have met uh, throughout the course of the project. So what was the project about? Uh, I think Alex has already given you uh, quite an interesting uh, a summary of it. So we did look at what happens to objects after they return. We're interested to see where they ended up, where they were located, how they were presented, but also what was the impact of the return, both on the community or the state that has returned the object and the institution or the state or the community that got this object in return. So what was the wider impact? And why did we decide to conduct this project well, I guess we identified a research gap. If you look a lot, um, if you read those stories, and I know a lot of you are working uh, in, this, in this area and may know what happened to object afterwards, but in a lot of databases that you may found where you have those stories told, quite often the story ends at the time when an object is actually returned. So we were really interested in looking what happens after, and thought that was a very interesting part of the, of the story. The story doesn't just end when an object is actually returned. And here, I just want to thank the Liver Home Trust that has funded this, this project. We still have a few more months to, to go to finalize our analysis. Um, because I think that they were open to a project that was going a little bit against the current, although there's been a lot of interest in restitution over the last at least, at least five years. Um, there's been a growing interest in that, a lot of debate. This was something a little bit different and we're very thankful uh, to them to have funded something uh, like this that didn't necessarily have an immediate uh, impact uh, that, that would be obvious. How did we go um, about this project? So our methodology was based on case studies uh, and Alke who's here and with whom I developed the project has been instrumental in, in doing a long list, a very long, long list first of all of the sparse restitution uh, processes that we considered. Uh, and we narrow it down uh, to a few, I'll, I'll highlight um, which ones they are. And what we then wanted to do after some kind of background analysis was to do field visits and interviews, both where the object was returned and where it was returned from, to really start to think of the impact on both sides. So the case studies. So if you look clockwise, so we had the return uh, of a dagger and Ponga, who is here, who's gonna be uh, discussing it a little bit uh, more in detail because he 
conducted actually the um, the field interviews for her, for us in the field visit. What I forgot to mention is that, of course, there was COVID as well, quite at the start of our project, that still had an impact on travel uh, restrictions. So that had an impact on, on, on our methodology. We couldn't do all of the, um, the field visits and interviews ourselves. We did as much as we could, but we're very grateful to find very um, talented um, and expert uh, researcher to help us with, with gathering some interviews and Punga did that for Indonesia and Dino who's uh, sitting here they did that for Chile. We also had Kavana Chiroro who did some of those field interviews and visits in Namibia for us. Um, we looked also at the return of a, of a statue from France to Cambodia, the return of an idol from Germany to Nepal, and Elke will say a little bit more about that particular case study. We're looking still at the return of a Maconde mask from a private museum in Switzerland back to Tanzania, to various objects and archival records that were returned from Germany to Namibia, the return of uh, Jesuit bells, church bells from churches, various churches in Wales that were returned to Santiago. It also ended up in various sites in Santiago and Dino will say a little bit more about how they, uh, where they ended up. Um, and I will say a little bit more about the return of a totem pole um, that took place in 2006 and that was returned from a museum in Sweden that would return to the Heisla community in British Columbia, Canada. I will use this particular case study to highlight some of our preliminary findings that I think are applicable to a lot of our case studies. So just bear in mind that those are quite general for now, um, but I will use the case of the totem pole to explain them a little bit more. So just for those who are not familiar with this case, the Gobskolox pole was commissioned by Chief Gobskolox, the chief of a clan from the Heisla Nation, which is one of the first nation from British Columbia. and British Columbia, you have close to 200 First Nations. It's quite uh, far north uh, in the province. This pole was erected because he had lost all members of his family to a small, smallpox epidemic. So it was a remembrance, uh, a memorial pole. In the 1920s, it was cut and sent to Sweden. So I'm giving you really a short summary. There was a trend at the time for European museums to each have uh, their own totem poles. It was a prestige uh, thing to have. The pole went to Sweden. Of course, I should highlight as well that the First Nation had not given its consent, was not aware that the pole was being uh, cut um, and didn't know of its whereabouts until the 1990s. In 1980, actually, it was eventually exhibited in Sweden. It had been sort of in storage because they didn't quite have a building that had sufficient height to exhibit it. In uh, 1980, they built a museum with a room that had that specific height. So it had impacted even the building of, of that museum. Um, and afterwards, the, the, the nation, the Heisler nation heard of the whereabouts of the poles in a somewhat random manner. They claim it back and eventually 2006, it was returned. First, it ended up um, in Vancouver, the Museum of Anthropology, where I used to work um, there at the time, it was exhibited there for two months, and then it went back to the nation further in the north. So the preliminary findings that I want to share with you, and I'll say a little bit more about this case. The first one is that context matters. And when we talk about context in terms of um, repatriation, return, restitution, we often talk about the historical context. You know, when was it taken? You know, during a, a looting period, was it a war, et cetera? And of course that matters, but what also matters in terms of the return, what happens to an object is the contemporary context. What is happening now? Um, and when I, I travel um, to Canada, there was a lot of, and there are a lot of discussions still, of course, ongoing about the, the, the impact of residential school of the need to revitalize culture because for a long time, First Nation children were sent um, by force to those schools where they couldn't practice their language, couldn't practice uh, their culture. Uh, and now there is a whole uh, process of reconciliation, of reparations, and also of cultural revitalization. So really you have to understand that the, the return of that pole fits within that much larger contemporary context. Then another preliminary finding is that it's often about the right thing to do. 
And this is why I think we were quite pleased that originally we, we um, picked the title Beyond Restitution, because we're really looking at something that goes beyond the, uh, any legal basis to return something. Quite often these objects were taken a long time ago and there's no real legal framework. And if we're talking about an ethical framework, and for a lot of the people who have returned or entities, museums, states that have returned an object, they felt that it, this was the right thing to do for them. Another um, preliminary finding is that there's no ideal solution. So just to be aware of those sorts of solutions presented as win-win. In the case of the totem pole, for example, they had done the, the community had offered a replica because they felt that was the only way that eventually the original pole would be returned the original pole had become part of the national collection of the museum. So the government felt that it should be replaced by like for like. So they offered to do this replica, which now stands outside of the museum in Sweden as a, a picture of it there. But I think since then, both at the museum as well as within the community, there's, there's been this sense of better understanding of what totems poles are. They're not meant to be replicated. They represent one story. They should never be duplicated. Uh, so I think that there is perhaps still a, a form of resentment uh, from the community that this replica was made. Um, so perhaps another solution would have been to commission a new pole, an entirely new pole, which would have supported living culture, a living culture, because totem poles are still being carved to this day. So just to be aware a bit of those sometimes ideal solutions, we have others, others in other case study as well that may seem ideal and may not be in practice seen as ideal by, by both parties. An interest in an object can also be very, very diverse. Um, we often talk about different stakeholders. Uh, you have states, you have communities, et cetera. But this is even true within a very, very small community. The Heisla community, the Heisla nation, most of them live in Kitamat village, which is only 700 individuals. And still within such a small community, you find very diverse view. I talked to some people who felt that the poll should have been returned. Most of the people felt that it should have been returned. But within that, some people felt, well, it should have been housed in a museum-like facility, which was the original plan, which was what they had said they would do in, in accordance with the agreement with the museum. But some members of the community felt, no, the pole should return to nature because that's the nature of a totem pole. They should go back to nature and disintegrate. So here, different views, even if they agreed on the return. And there is still another very minority view within the community that this object should not have been returned because it was seen as bad luck. So even within such a small community, I think you can find really views at different end of the spectrum. And I think that's something to bear in mind when it, we talk about a community perspective. It may not be as uniform uh, as, it, as it seems. Another um, perhaps preliminary finding is that the reinsertion of objects is a process. It's a learning process. On the top right, I have a picture of the panel that is now placed in the museum in Stockholm, where the pole used um, to be, the original poles used to be. What's really interesting is that they explain what totem poles are. And at the very end, they say, well, the pole that was returned is now disintegrating in nature, going back to nature in accordance with Heisla tradition and practice. But at the time when it was returned in 2006, they really were keen for the pole to be conserved. Uh, and to be transferred in a museum-like facility within the nation and not to go back to nature. So I think over time, the return process helped as well to have a better understanding of those cultural um, perspectives uh, from the First Nations. So I think that's quite interesting that it's a learning process. Even after the poll was returned, they've, they've made the whole uh, learning journey that has continued. And it has been in a way similar for the First Nations. Um, my previous work was working uh, in the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, I was returning ancestral remains to communities. What they were telling me is that they um, know how to bury their dead, but they don't know how to rebury them. So I think it's the same with objects, is that these objects have changed. They have become museum objects after having been in Europe. So how do you really return them into a context? At the beginning, when it was returned in 2006, 
most um, community members thought that the pole should be housed in a museum-like facility. As they were waiting, they had plans to build this new, uh, this new place. The pole was held, housed in a shopping mall for a few years, and it was used to, to teach children actually about, about the pole, about the practices, etc. And eventually, after a lot of discussion among the community, they decided that they should go back to nature. So even for them, they had to go through that whole process of discussion, of debate, uh, et cetera, within the communities to finally finalize where the poll should go. And the final, perhaps preliminary finding I'll, I'll mention for now is that proactivity requires a fundamental change and also funding. So in a lot of guidance that you find now regarding repatriation, return, et cetera, we talk about proactive repatriation. We're asking museums to be proactive. There's not always funding associated with that. I think that's problematic. Um, and quite a few um, people within museum that we've talked to find that problematic is sometimes they have to apply for grant. There's more and more funding being released as, as there is more interest in that. But you need, of course, funding for provenance research, but you need also funding for the return of an object itself. Like the return of a totem pole is not quite straightforward. It's not a small object, it's very large, so it can be very costly. But also I think there needs to be an understanding that repatriation can be something quite positive in terms of the learning, in terms of exchanges, etc. And I just here wanted to show you a sticker that is at the entrance of the Museum of Vancouver that says we support repatriation. So it's really a frame of mind. It doesn't mean that they return everything, um, but it means that in principle, they're very open to it. So I think it's also just a bit of, a, of an attitude perhaps uh, to have. And now just to conclude, I wanted to show you um, one interview that I conducted. Um, well, that was just the, the capture of some thought following an interview that I did um, at the Heisler Community School with the uh, language teacher, the Heisler language teacher, who is re revitalizing the, the, the culture. Uh, her name is Liana Smith, and she explains in this uh, very short video what the return of the poll meant to her, meant to her community, and then she talks about the, um, the return of cultural objects more in general. And I think her words are quite powerful, so I'd like to end with that. My recollection when the totem pole is returned, the Gapskol of pole, um, was a huge sense of pride, I would say. It was a very emotional moment, very overwhelming. Uh, I just remember a whole bunch of people and there was actually tears being shed that day. Um, I never really did talk to my aunt. I'm really close with my aunt Marilyn and uh, her father's Dan Paul Senior. But I could, you could just feel it, the emotion. And when everybody was in, because it was brought into our gym. And there was so many people, and like I said, they, they, they performed uh, our ceremonies. Um, I remember cedar boughs and uh, traditional regalias and dancing. Uh, it was a very happy time, and these items are, I, I feel, are a huge part of who we are and our spirituality as Indigenous people. Um, they all tell stories, they all have our history, and I feel uh, the importance on, uh, on items that were taken, a huge sense of urgency for it to be returned so that our history can be passed on from our elders on the stories behind these these items, especially in ways we utilize them. Um, a lot of people don't understand that uh, there was certain times to use these items. There is, uh, yeah, and for the children that I teach, uh, I I feel they they deserve to know our history so that they get a sense of belonging, a sense of who we are. Yeah.
So yeah, I guess this was just to, to show you that this project was very much a looking back project. We looked a lot in the past and sometimes people were quite surprised even, uh, you know, how far back we, we were going and, and asking a question about the past, but there is of course a, a meaning for the, for the future. And I think she puts it uh, really well. Very well, thank you. You've given us a very interesting overview of what the project's aims were. And I think that that case study, I think, highlights a lot of the things that you were, that you were looking at. Just a question about, about that particular respondent. You spoke to quite a number of people from the community. You actually, you went there physically. Um, so again, moving away from the hypotheticals that I talked about earlier, would you say that view was something that was, that was represented by others? Or was that something that was quite unique to that? particular respondent? I think, I mean, of, of course, for her, I mean, it's, it's her job, right? She's uh, teaching um, these kids their, their language that has been, is almost disappeared. I mean, very few people still still speak it. Uh, so I think she has a lot, a lot of stake in that. But I do think it's quite representative. She mentioned for those who, I mean, you may not have, have realized, something I perhaps didn't realize before going there is that the, the poll not only had a specific interest for the community, but that had a lot of interest for the family. She talks about her aunt, uh, who was the daughter of the descendant of Chief Box Pollocks. He's the last one who actually had that title inherited. So I think you, you talk to a lot of uh, family members who have very, very similar views. And as I mentioned, um, even you know this you know, quite small community, I did find also quite opposite views. There are people, she talked about this sense of urgency, the tie with the elders, that they want this object to be returned while the elders are still here to, to explain to them, you know, exactly what they mean and, and what the back, back story is. So I think there is a fear that this culture is, is being a, a little bit lost. Lost, but I also talk to other people working on this cultural revitalization and they say, we do want objects back, but we also would like some to be conserved um, and to have a sort to build a sort of, of cultural facility, maybe not quite a museum, but a cultural facility to house any objects they can they can have back. Um, and I have to say they have very little uh, that is that is still there. So um, they're hoping to have uh, a few more things uh, coming back their way. Great, thank you again for that, that wonderful presentation. Next, we have another member of the team, Dino Schiapacase. Dino holds a master's degree in public law with a specialization in cultural heritage law from Paris Sackville University in France. His thesis was on the relationship between the restitution of indigenous sacred items and cultural rights. He's a member of the public law department of the Chilean law firm of Claro y Kia in Santiago. And he's going to talk to us about another case study that was looked at in this project relating to the Bells of Santiago. So Dino, when you're ready. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to talk to you about the return of the Bells of Santiago, which is an event that I confess as a Chilean, I did not know about it until I worked on this project. So the, the objective of this presentation is to briefly provide a summary of the case, but from the Chilean perspective, and also to, and also to draw some preliminary points regarding the return of the bells and their impact on the population of Santiago. So, to begin with, um, what are the bells of Santiago? What is so interesting about them? So the first thing to notice is that they are bronze and copper bells that used to be originally placed in the belfry of the Church of the Jesuit Order in the Chilean capital. There are some of the few remnants of that church, which had been affected by fire in 1863 during the Feast of Immaculate Conception. In this fire, two, more than 2,000 people died. And such was the impact of the fire that a few days later, the city's fire brigade was founded by volunteers. Likewise, the president of the Republic ordered the church's demolition because the population considered that the place was cursed and that nothing was, and that nothing could be built on it. After the church was demolished, the bells were bought by a Welsh merchant named William Graham Vivian. He brought them to Wales in 1865.
but he did not smelt the bells. He gave them to All Saints Church in, in Oyster Mouth, Wales. There, the bells remained for almost 150 years. So what happened in Chile during 150 years? Well, none of the authorities knew about the existence of the bells. Nobody was aware of their final destination until 2006, when the then ambassador to the United Kingdom, Mariano Fernandez, he heard about the existence of the bells. In October 2009, Mariano Fernandez, he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and on the occasion of the arrangements for the Republic's Bicentennial, instructed the, to, the ambassador to the United Kingdom to request and negotiate the return of the bells. According to our interview with Mariano Fernandez and Fernando Montes Mate, who was once the head of the Jesuit order in Chile and who was at the time rector of a Jesuit university, the return of the bells of the Jesuit order was important for Chile because unlike other Latin American countries, the colonial cultural heritage is scarce. For the return of the bells to be, for the return of the bells to be undertaken, two hurdles had to be, had to be um, overcome. One of them was complying with the decision-making process in Wales. The other was giving consideration to the Welsh Anglican Church. That is to say, or in other terms, um, providing a monetary retribution or, or of any other kind. While the decision-making process was still pending in February 2010, the, Chilean, the, the central area of Chile was affected by a tsunami and an earthquake, and more than 500 people died. Later, the Anglican Church in Wales communicated its decision of donating the bells so that, so that they could become part of a memorial, not only in remembrance of the victims of the fire, but also those who lost their lives and livelihood after the earthquake and the tsunami. So this, this memorial would be placed in the church's former site, which today corresponds to the gardens of the ex-National Congress in Santiago. So, so the, bells, the bells arrived in Chile in September 2010, and they, were, and they were received by the President of the Republic in a handover ceremony in front of the governmental palace. The bells were given by the, by the ambassador, by the British ambassador, and for such purpose, a memorial was built. This memorial remained in front of the governmental palace until December the 8th of 2010. In other words, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. After that, the bells were distributed. Two of them were taken to the ex-National Congress and they, were, and they remained hanging in the, original, in the original memorial until 2019. This memorial was replaced by another one of which the design had been chosen by means of a public competition. And unlike other memorials, bells are not at height, they are at the ground level. And this idea has been controversial amongst our interviews. Some, think, some of them think that it was interesting, that it was daring, that it was, that it was a thought out idea. Well, as others, they think that we're just, that the bells are hidden, that they're at the margin of history, just so that that they are at the margin of history, that they can, they, that they can, that they are prevented of being a reminder of events that occurred in the city, because nobody can see them if they're just uh, if they are underground. On the other hand, the third bell was was given to the Santiago Fire Brigade, and it was installed at the beginning in an internal courtyard, in in its general headquarters. Afterwards, this area turned into, into the entrance plaza of the Firefighters Museum, which is freely and publicly accessible. The return of the bells not only led to the construction of memorials, it also led to the adoption of other measures by the Chilean actors. For instance, in 2011, in 2011, 
um, the Chilean state decorates it, Reverend Keith Evans and the Bishop John, Dave, John Davis as a sign of gratefulness. Likewise, that same year, the Chamber of Representatives requested the President of the Republic to submit a bill of law ratifying the 1970 con UNESCO Convention on the grounds that the return of the bells and other isolated cases demonstrate the lack of a state policy towards the recovery of cultural heritage. And finally, the return of the bells of Santiago inspired the donation of a fourth bell, which had been found in St. Thomas's church in Neath, Wales. This bell was donated to, to the British and Commonwealth Fire and Rescue Company, JAS Jackson, which is part of the Santiago Fire Brigade, and of which Prince Edward, the current Duke of Edinburgh, is an honorary member. So this bill, this bill was, done, was handed over in a special service in St. Thomas's Church in 2012. The handover was, and it was given to Prince Edward. Afterwards, in 2013, the bell was the bell became part of a memorial honoring the firefighters and their 150th year. This, this uh, memorial can be seen from the streets, from the sidewalk, and the bell is rung at noon every day and, on, and to mark special occasions. For example, um, after the decease of, of His Majesty Prince Philip in 2021. So according to our preliminary findings, um, one could make the following, following points. First, the return of the Bells of Santiago is, is, an important, is important because it is because it is one of the cases that led the Republic of Chile to ratify the 1970 UNESCO Convention. Likewise, it also shows that current events can, 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 can be an impetus for the return of cultural objects, but also they can overshadow the process. The first case cor would correspond to the earthquake and tsunami, but we can we also need to consider that um, the bells were handed over in September 2010. And in October 2010, a few days later, 33 miners were rescued from the inside of San Jose mine. So this event overshadowed the return of the, the return of the bells of Santiago. And finally, um, my last point, and, consider, and also considering what Kristen just said, that re the reinsertion of cultural objects is a learning process. Circumstances such as restricted access and visibility, as well as the absence of the community's participation in the decision-making process, says, ex can explain why the return of the bells had, did not have a massive impact on the population of Santiago, but one mainly focused or limited to the political authorities and the firefighting community. We can also consider that it is important, considering that it is a learning process. For example, one of the visits that I did, one of the places that I visited was the firefighting museum. There, they had, they had undertaken the following measures. Firstly, they built a memorial. They built a memorial in an access plaza, which is, which is freely and publicly accessible. Anyone can go there under the time schedule of the, of the museum. Secondly, they also construct, they built a museum. So they can offer visitors a whole experience, which is, it just goes beyond the mere object of the bells. But what happens is that when I go there, when I went there, I know, I, as I didn't know about this case until I worked on the project, I was very keen to, to verify if all the memoirs had an explanatory plate. So I noticed that there wasn't an explanatory plate. I remarked it to the museum's personnel because I just told them when someone comes to the museum as an independent visitor, that is to say someone come, who does not come for, an, for a guided visit, this next, which starts next to the bell, this person is at risk of missing the information concerning the bell. So after this, they, we shared our, our sources with them. 
And we also put them in contact with David Vasquez, who is head of the section of studies at the, at the National Congress's library. He wrote once one of the leaflets that was given out during the, during the handover ceremony of the bells. So as I would like lastly to remind you that um, this presentation does not cover or did not cover the Welsh side. The research conducted in Wales, interestingly, demonstrated that for the community of All Saints Church, donating the bells meant the disposal of, eval of valued objects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dino, for that fascinating explanation of the case study and where it stands today. And your findings, preliminary findings are, are most interesting. I wonder, you mentioned just at the end, the, the view from the Welsh side, which we haven't heard much about, but I know that was part of the research that I think Kristen did on the project. And maybe in a, a minute or so, if you could let us know <laughs> what, what the view was from the, let's say the community that lost something in a sense, uh, as Dino said. Yeah, that's that's actually a really interesting point. So we decided to stick just to the Chilean side because there's actually really a lot to be said uh, on the on the Welsh side, and we'll share that perhaps uh, another time. But I think that what happened on the Welsh side is perhaps also why we picked that case study because the bells were actually really important uh, in Wales and around Swansea, and they were they were very well known. And, and you see, it's interesting. You're from Santiago, and you say, well, you didn't know about this case although they were returned when, when you were there, right? Um, but the, the bells in Wales had been um, the topic of plays in school, of a, a sound and light show that was extremely popular. Uh, and there was a whole myth around these uh, bells of Santiago. And I talked to some people who said, well, they, they felt, and again, that goes back to the right thing to do, right? They felt it was the right thing for them to return them not just because there was that contemporary context that was important to so the earthquake, uh, but also some of them felt very close to what happened in Chile because they were descendants of the Cape Horners. So they said that they still felt this sort of link, uh, but it was also part for them, the bells of uh, tangible evidence of you know, the, the, the whole history of trade. Um, and I mean, Swansea was Copperopolis, so uh, it's part, it was really very much part of, of their history uh, as well. So uh, a, whole, a whole other side we'll, we'll share more on uh, in a bit. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Really interesting to see the, the two sides there in comparison. Next, we're going to hear about one particular case study that was quite important in the, in the overall research that related to Nepal and items that were returned to that country. And for that, uh, we're very honored to have Elke Selter talking about it. Dr. Elke Selter is a research fellow in cultural heritage at Bickel, which she joined in 2021. Earlier, she worked um, for over 15 years with agencies at the UN, especially UNESCO, in countries around the world, including in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. She now works as coordinator for heritage in emergencies with the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage in Belgium. She holds a PhD in international politics from SOAS, not very far away from here, and is particularly interested in issues around restorative justice and peace building through heritage. So very fitting background to, I think, what you're looking at now. So Elke, it's all yours. Thank you, Alex, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about one of them. It was very difficult, but in all these cases that we've looked at to just pick one, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the one in Nepal because I think it very well highlights the value of just looking at what happens after. Um, the case that we picked from, like Christine said, we made a very long list of potential cases that fitted all our criteria. And uh, the one that fitted was a return of an Uma Maheshwar. This is a Hindu iconography um, statue or, or idol um, to Nepal. And actually the case itself is quite straightforward. Um, you see on the picture kind of left top, a quite realistic painting of where it had originally been in a water spout in a village. This is a, an art project by an American artist called Joylyn Davis, who painted in gold these disappeared statues in their original location. 
um, the statue disappeared somewhere in the 80s, was sold to a museum in Berlin, Museum of Indian Art, which today no longer exists. Uh, the museum didn't know it was stolen. Um, at the moment that it was identified as stolen, they immediately decided to return it. So actually, the return process was quite straightforward, um, very mum complex. The director of the museum went with uh, the idol in a plane to Nepal, where it was handed over to the Patan Museum, which is not the National Museum, but it was a brand new museum and the most kind of state of the art museum uh, in the Kathmandu Valley at the time. And it is still there today. You see the, the big picture is kind of its current location. And so up to there would have been quite a simple, perhaps not so interesting case. Now, where it becomes interesting and what actually interested me initially in looking at this was I, I spent quite a few years working and living in Nepal uh, about 20 years ago and um, um, was quite well aware of the fact that you have this strong living heritage culture in, in the Kathmandu Valley. So statues, I, I'm calling them statues here because for ease of reference, uh, they are gods and goddesses, and they're worshipped as, as living beings. Um, you see on all the, the three pictures kind of clustered on the right of the slide, uh, how they are worshipped with the vermilion powder and flower petals and rice grains. And um, these idols are everywhere throughout the Kathmandu Valley. They're in temples, they're in shrines, but they're also in the middle of the street and on squares. Uh, <laughs> And I've juxtaposed this here to the Uma Maheshwar in the Patan Museum, which as you can see is kind of a sterile environment. Uh, <laughs> it's not what, this, uh, what the role of this statue used to be. And that's what I was interested in. Uh, but as Christine said, we, we started the project during COVID years and it took a while uh, <laughs> before we could do the actual field work. And in between something really interesting happened which had nothing to do with Uma Mahashore, but then in the end turned out to have a lot to do with it. Um, in spring of 2021, this Lakshmi Narayan uh, idol, which you see, it's the one in the middle of the big picture, uh, was returned from a museum in Dallas in the United States uh, to the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, it followed a trajectory initially quite similar to the Uma Mahashore because it also ended up in the Patan Museum. Uh, for a short while, uh, because in December 21, it was returned to the community. Um, and you see, these are pictures taken from the Nepali Times newspaper um, of the events surrounding the return. So from the museum back to the local temple and the picture in the middle, you see that it was also this cleaned up statue that had been in the museum. Um, but they quite immediately started worshiping it, which this, uh, this highly fascinating story about the copper clothing. Um, and the big picture is one that I took during fieldwork where you see it being back in the temple and you can see from uh, the powder and so on it that it's really being worshiped. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because it's, it seems to have been a case that triggered a change in mindset in Nepal um to return statues from museums to the community um just for the ones that are interested in the legal context uh, they have so the ancient monument preservation act is the one act that's kind of guiding all things heritage in nepal goes back to the 50s, um, but there was an amendment in 86 in which this article was added that already allowed the state to give objects back to, let's say, the community at large to keep it in what they call its usual place. Um, this hasn't really been used for restitution or returns from abroad until the 2021 case. Um, now watch was this change and why do I think it's interesting? Because when I was doing my field work, there was an interest in also returning to Uma Maheshwar. So it has been in the Patan Museum for two decades now. And while doing the field work, there was all these discussions as to should it also now go back to the village. I actually joined the museum director to go and talk to the community. Uh, so there is a very strong interest. Um, 
definitely the Lakshmi Narayan case and all it got really a lot of attention uh, in the media and social media that has definitely helped it has kind of <laughs> speeded up something that was probably already slowly changing um, there was a legal context that allowed for it, but the legal context did not make the difference. It had been there since the 80s. Um, what did make a difference, I believe, is that uh, you have the Nepal Heritage Recovery Campaign, which is a, a group of activists from different fields. It's heritage people, but it's also journalists and lawyers and, and who have been and become extremely active and very vocal. Um, in terms of getting things back from abroad, but also in terms of uh, restituting uh, objects to the community. Um, they are, and that is something I had not really expected. They're on one line with the government and the museum people. Of course, <laughs> activists are activists and the government is the government and conservatives are conservators. So it's not like they're 100% having the same opinion, but, um, I had not expected, for instance, the director of the National Museum to say, oh, I'm happy to see statues leave my museum. I'm happy to give it back to the people. Um, so in that sense, I think, in general, the opinions are aligned. Linked to, of course, the fact that this living culture is still very much alive. I think maybe there is a big difference with Canada where there's the fear of it disappearing. I think in Nepal, it's very much alive, which is also the reason why people who are trained conservators on the one hand, but on the other hand, fully part of this living culture, decide, you know what, even if it goes a bit against conservation standards, let's put it back in the temples. Um, and a supportive political level, I think definitely on the, on, the, on the side of the US embassy. A lot of these initial returns come from the US and there did not seem to be any questions asked as in, you should put this in a museum, this should be preserved properly. Um, they seem to be quite happy with the fact that this goes back to the community. Again, it doesn't mean that everything's perfect. Um, like Christine also said, community is not one unit. The one in, in Dulikel, so where the Uma Maheshwar came from, um, most people kind of want it to come back, but the reason why it has not come back yet, and this is it's now one and a half years ago that I did this field work and joined the director. The reason why it hasn't gone back yet is because the community cannot agree. They cannot agree unanimously or in majority whether it should go back or not, and if it goes back where it should go back to. The main reason is fear of security. They are really worried that it's, it comes from a water spout, not from a temple, so it's quite hard to protect it. People are afraid that it will be stolen again. One of the reasons, there's other discussions ongoing, but it's an interesting example, I believe, that though there is a lot of interest in community returns, and I do believe that Nepal is a very interesting case in terms of what's happening in general, it's also not so simple. And I think, link to that the challenge of how can such a process be facilitated right now you have that one clause in the law which is enough to allow for it to happen but there is nothing else that helps these people discuss there is no procedures or even guidelines that explain for instance well according to the law uh, you can have it back if you're going to worship it but if you want it back to put in a local museum that's going to be far more tricky because that's not actually what's written um, so they're a bit left to their own devices and I know there's discussions going on in the government on how to better facilitate that which I think is now uh, the big step to take in order to have this process continue but it is continuing since I did the field work there's other statues that have come back uh, to temples so I believe it's a very interesting and fascinating case. I think that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Elke, for that, that fascinating exposition of the situation in Nepal. Just one quick question to follow up. What was the view, do you think, from the larger society there in, in Nepal, as opposed to the particular, say, religious communities? Was there generally support for restitution efforts? I think so. I think, I mean, 
I actually was like I, I said I was I was amazed at how much the different kind of if you can put them into groups groups looked into the same direction um, also from publics where I had not necessarily expected it because in other cases you meet conservators who, who kind of want things to be conserved neatly at proper temperatures and humidity rates and whatever and um, that was very different but what also really surprised me is even the community itself um, before going to to the village um i was kind of and maybe that's a common worry that comes with doing field work i thought well, how what am i going to do i'm going to arrive in this village and then who am i going to talk to about a statue that was stolen 40 years ago and also very much thinking from my own context like if i would ask in my own city about a random statue and call it by name <laughs> I, i'm from a heritage place and i don't think people would know what i'm talking about and so we, we just asked shopkeepers and people on the street and everybody knew about it and they had an opinion about it. So I haven't done this field work prior to the Lakshmi Narayan case. So I can't say for sure and how far that has changed the mindset, but I was really surprised in how much it was living as a topic um, for you know anyone we asked. And, and I think that itself shows kind of how valuable these processes can be. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Well, as you know, with this project, and we heard already from Kristen, there are a number of different case studies that are being looked at. Today, we only have time for, for a few of these. Um, the last that we're going to cover, certainly not the least, but a very interesting one involving Indonesia, is going to be presented by Panga Ardiansha. Uh, Panga is a PhD candidate of history of art and archaeology at, at SOAS, as well, as we know, not too far away. So you didn't have too far to come today, which is yep. which is good. We're happy to have you here. Um, Panga's doctoral research focuses on the afterlives of Hindu Buddhist materials in pre-modern Indonesia, a project which um, contributes to decolonizing the field of Indonesian art history and archaeology. In 2021, he co-edited a very interesting volume entitled "Returning Southeast Asia's Past: Objects, Museums, and Restitution." Highly recommended. And he's also on another research project right now called Circumambulating Objects on Paradigms of Restitution of Southeast Asian Art. So without further ado, Panga. Thank you, Alex, uh, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, Before I begin, I would like to thank um, Elke and Kristen as well for inviting me to this very interesting project. I guess it's very important um, topic that we need to discuss in and around the issue of restitution. And I see that more and more people are talking about this recently, but I guess you, we both, like we all, like in this project, are taking the earliest step, I guess, in heading to these directions. Um, anyway, I'm I'm gonna talk a bit more about the uh, Indonesian case studies about the uh, return of the grace of uh, Prince Diponegoro. Uh, but before I talk about the grace, um, I should say something about Diponegoro, who's Images are on the on the slides um, to understand his important uh, within the uh, historical imagination of Indonesia as a modern state. Um, so, Diponegoro was a former crown prince in a local court in uh, Yogyakarta, in the island of uh, Java, which can be said as the center of um, authority or power in Indonesia, the island of Java. Uh, he enacted war against the uh, Dutch uh, colonial authority in uh, 1825 until 1830, uh, mainly because he saw that the rural at the time has become had become the puppet of, of the colonial power at the time. So he rebelled on, on that particular cause. And um, he was uh, arrested in 1830 by the uh, Dutch army. Uh, and later on, uh, I'm jumping up here to the uh, early 20th century. So uh, we see that he now become the uh, sort of the ideal uh, national hero of Indonesia. Uh, is a is an anachronistic uh, production, of course, uh, because we don't have Indonesia in the early 19th century. Uh, Indonesia only uh, declare uh, gain independence uh, in the uh, 1940s, in the 1945 to be exact. And uh, I think the impulse to to put Tiponogoro into the pedestal of national hero uh, come down into two things. First is that the Jaffa War uh, was a very uh, 
damaging war for the colonial authorities. It almost crippled the uh, colonial power financially. And it is because of this pressure that they um, that he almost crippled the the the, uh, the colonial uh, power that they uh, invite the Ponogoro to come to a, under the pretense of peace negotiations in the March, I think in March 1830. Uh, I cannot remember correctly, but uh, under this pretense, they actually arrested the Ponogoro when they arrived at the site. So it it's it's it now become the emblem of a colonial treasury in the history of Indonesia. So that's why the Ponogoro became sort of like most coveted or the much coveted uh, national hero now in Indonesia. And uh, we saw a lot of, um, and this uh, sort of like creation of national hero now came into a lot of um, projections. Uh, one of them is production of, of uh, statues in public spaces. You, if you visit Indonesia, if you ever visit Indonesia, you will find it's a good chance we will, we will find the Ponogoro statues in Jakarta or in other places in, in Java as well. Uh, and also uh, in the slide is also uh, my favorite actually uh, is a is a is a shadow pop uh, about or on the Ponogoro. It's depicting the figure of the Ponogoro made in uh, 1979s with I think my uh, connected might be connected to the return of his saddle spares uh, stirrups that was uh, confiscated in the early 19th century and came back to Indonesia in 1978. So maybe there's a connection there. But uh, we will focus on the uh, story on the return of Chris that happened in the March uh, 2020. And uh, LK may uh, say something more later on the uh, permanent research for this uh, uh, Chris, uh, because she did the uh, field work for the uh, Netherlands side. But what I should say, or I should note in, in this case is that uh, this Chris is not, that was written in Indonesia in March 2020 may not be the primary grace of Iponogoro. That it was the grace that was given to Dutch uh, representative ahead of this uh, so-called peace negotiation. So the grace was actually a, a goodwill gift saying, Iponogoro saying that he will uh, attend uh, the negotiations by giving up uh, the grace. So this is the grace that came back to Indonesia. Uh, so I've written, um, a reflection on the legal frameworks and recognition of the importance of the Ponogoro for Indonesia uh, for the BIACL block. Can I say it correctly? Um, so I, I will not uh, restate that, but uh, I wish that in this opportunity I will add a couple of things uh, to so that we can further reflect on what this written means for the Indonesian society, but also importantly for the uh, family of uh, the Ponogoro in Indonesia as well. So um, in March 2020, after it was uh, returned, displayed for the first time in the presidential palace, uh, there's a debate actually, uh, a very heated debate, a public debate in Indonesia about the authenticity, authenticity of this Greece, uh, even after it under, has undergone uh, profit and research in the Netherlands. Uh, the point of contentions was actually in the iconography of the Greece. Uh, if you see the close-up Greece here, uh, you will see a, a head of, of a dragon, a head of, of, of naga or a snake. Uh, this Chris is called Kiai Siluman or Silty Dragons. Uh, but according to most Chris experts, local Chris experts in Indonesia, this motif is actually Nogo Sosro, not Nogo Siluman, which is a different one. And there is a costume in Java to name the Chris based on the motif. So if it, this is Nogo Sosro, this cannot be named Nogo Siluman which is different kind of craze. And so, so this controversy then uh, creeping in and uh, on the question of authenticity, whether Indonesia got the right craze or not, because the name of the craze is different with the motif of the craze. Um, and it's raging on for a few months in, um, in social media. Um, during, uh, and we also need to take account that it's happened during the early months of pandemics as well, COVID pandemic. Uh, so people are really sticking into their phone because they cannot go anywhere uh, anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, but what we can see is that uh, there are, there are of course uh, nuances that lost in the debate. Uh, it's not, of course, first people doesn't really see this as uh, not a primary case of Diponogoro. They see this just a case of Diponogoro. 
uh, that's the first thing. But second thing is also speak about the ownership of, of people of Goro by the whole society of Indonesia. That they want to make sure that we got the right Chris that once belonged to, to this very uh, important figure for Indonesia. So um, as a response to the debate, uh, the Indonesian government uh, actually produced an exhibition on November, or October until November 2020, uh, which might be a good thing uh, because if we contrast this to the uh, Nusantara collection return that happened a few months back in the December 2019, there is no debate on that, and it has, and there is no display on that. It just goes straight to the storage of national museum. So maybe it's a good thing to have a controversy in, <laughs> on on the return. Um, but I think this debate is more in a more positive way. I guess in, it's, it's a way to show care by the Indonesian community. Uh, so what the figure of Diponegoro, like I said, to to make sure that we the Indonesian cut the the right or the, the authentic risk of, of Diponogor. But what happened after this uh, exhibition is that the Chris now gone into the stories of the National Museum so on display. Uh, the only other occasion that it was on display is on the uh, Chris International Festival in November 2021. But then it come back to uh, stories again. Uh, but there's no questioning, there's no debate on, on, this, on, this, on this situation. There's no one actually questioning why is it in the storage and not on display in Indonesia. Not when people are questioning the authenticity. So I guess there is a, there is a, a sense of uh, emotional value, I guess, uh, attached to the, to the Chris, that as long as the Chris is on the hand of Indonesians, whether or not it's on display or not, not it doesn't matter as long as we have it, you know, as long as we have it inside the border of Indonesia. So it, it speaks to the idea of care and ownership as well. Um, fun fact is that there is an increased demand actually on the production of Chris with the same motive with, with the Chris that came back to Indonesia. So there is like the Chris enthusiast is very, very, um, yeah, very in tune with, with, with this. Uh, return and then they want to make a new craze with with the same motive with, with the one that returned to Indonesia. But uh, the but the the question about the care and patrimony also bring us to the question of how then the family of or descendant of the Ponogoro figure in all this process. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's no involvement of of the of the family in the in the return process uh, except from a phone call from one of the member of the uh, verification. Uh, team from Indonesia that came to the Netherlands. Uh, there is not even invitation to the uh, public display in the, in the palace in March 2020, not even invitation to open or see the, uh, the, uh, the exhibitions on the slide in the, at the National Museum. And um, so there is also sort of like uh, exclusion of, of, of family in here. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the figure of the Ponogoro is already co-opted by, by the national state of Indonesia, already in, under the care of, of the national state of Indonesia and not, and not the family. But if we go back to the controversy of, of the authenticity of the, of, the, of the name and the motive of the Chris, uh, it was actually the family of the Ponogoro who kind of played down the controversy. Because when there was controversy, uh, the, the media came to the family and one of the, one of the elder actually said, uh, very interesting quote. He, he said that, uh, and this is from Ronnie Sodewo, I should mention his name. Um, he's one of the elders, also the founder of the family organizations. Uh, and Ronnie said that uh, he, it is possible for him that the, the name of the Chris is not in accordance with the motive of the Chris. And then he believed that this Chris that was written to Indonesia was once belonged to Diponobo. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful statement on the face of the exclusion of, of all this institution and cooptation of, of, of his great, great, great grandfathers by the national state of Indonesia. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ronnie. Thank you very much, Panga. I was going to ask if you have a, a crease now that there's a industry. But... No, no, no. Okay. Um, but that's very interesting to see what's happening and that that sort of tension between the state and the family is is quite palpable in, in the way you tell it. 
Uh, just a maybe a quick follow-on question for for Elke because we already heard from Panga um, about the provenance research that was needed on the Dutch side. So we've heard about the Indonesian side. Do you have any anything to add from the from the Dutch side on that? Um, I think what was most interesting for me about this case and and, and looking at the Netherlands, so the, the Indonesia part of the research happened before uh, the, I went to to the Netherlands, and I. Um, had heard a lot about the controversy. And the other thing that um, seemed to come out of a lot of interviews was that the Indonesian side felt like they had not been sufficiently involved in the provenance research. Um, so that's a bit the background with which I went to the Netherlands. Um, and I think the one thing that I learned, um, well, I learned many things about this case, but for me, the thing that stood out the most was how complicated provenance research is and how difficult it is to take those decisions at which point, in this case, the Indonesian side should have gotten involved. Um, because the the story on the, on the Dutch side is, uh, well, basically from independence and from the moment there was in the 70s an agreement with the Netherlands and Indonesia in which a key number of, of objects would be returned and objects belonging to the Ponegoro was part of that. Um, at that point, the Chris, the whereabouts of the Chris were unknown. There was an assumption it was in the Netherlands, but nobody really knew for sure. And so basically up until 2019, there's been various occasions at which people have started making efforts to look for it. And it's only kind of around 2017, I believe, that by accident an archival record was found through which they then knew that it was highly likely that it was in the collection, which then made them look much more in depth um, at the case. And once they were more or less sure that the object was part of their collection, they started involving Indonesians at various stages. There were also some political complexities <laughs> on the Indonesian end, um, but they went actually quite far all the way from like Chris experts who could feel the energy of sacred Chris's to experts, to historians, to government people. Um, and, and so by the time I came back from the Netherlands, I wasn't so sure anymore whether they had not involved the Indonesians early enough because, well, they didn't know they had it. So do you involve people before you know you have it? Or do you start going a part of the route until you are relatively certain it's probably one of a number of Chris's in your collection and then start involving people? And I think for me, that was kind of the important side of, of this, that it's not so straightforward. Um, but also then linked to the controversy in, in Indonesia that it's super important to have really good provenance research because that kind of, especially with social media, <laughs> with important figures, that kind of discussions can live and to have a historic record that you can fall back on that says, you know, to the best of our knowledge, this is the process that we followed, this is what we know, and it's on this basis that we concluded that this is a chemist that belonged to the Pomodoro um, is also quite essential because otherwise these controversies can, can just keep on going and you never know. I mean, it's historic research. They may find another one at some point, but <laughs> but for now, this quite, I mean, this, this was very comprehensive research that was done, so. Great, really, really interesting points. Um, I wonder if I could just open it up to just the, the entire panel something that Elke just mentioned around the different possible stakeholders and how you involve them, who you involve and at what stage. We've seen claims relating to states, relating to communities, uh, relating to families, relating to fire brigades even involved. I mean, incredible number, variety of possible stakeholders. If any of you have any thoughts on how you involve these, these various groups and when you might think of involving them. So yeah, I guess our, our research has shown that that you have a variety of, of stakeholders um, that should be involved. And I have mentioned the, the proactive um, 
repatriation processes that are now being pushed uh, forward. So that would mean that a museum should not only be proactively doing provenance research, but should seek to be transparent and also to contact the right uh, co communities or the, the right state involved. Now, it's interesting, actually, uh, perhaps I want to say something about the, the latest uh, sort of, of development. So uh, you had that Mondia Kuld uh, declaration that was adopted uh, last year, and we, we wrote a, a blog piece about it. And what's really interesting, so um, 150 UNESCO member states supported that declaration. Um, and it's, it's stated that, you know, stakeholders should, should be involved, including at the community level. So it's very interesting because you have member states of UNESCO saying that, you know, to go kind of below uh, the state level. And then you have um, another quite recent development that was the, the Martinez report uh, that came out, I think, uh, a couple of, uh, of months ago in France, uh, looking at, you know, what should be the framework. And they're, they're really talking about state to state. Uh, relationships is kind of a little bit going. So I think we haven't quite found uh, really the, the right way to go forward uh, just yet and, and more work should, should be done. But I think uh, what we've seen is that yes, communities should uh, should be uh, involved uh, when they are uh, the key stakeholders. Um, do you want to? Maybe just to add another level, um the museum to museum one um we didn't talk about the cambodia french case um but that is one where you have quite complex legislation especially on the french side and we're actually again in the spirit of, of what christine mentioned in canada as a, as a kind of conclusion that we also found in other cases is um people in the museum really felt like it was the right thing to do to return this head of a statue to be reunited with the body of the statue which was still in Cambodia. Um, and they kind of from museum to museum found the solution to get that done. It's a long-term renewable loan and an exchange because the Cambodians gave a foot piece of another statue to, to Cambodia instead. Um, it's of course, it's not necessarily ideal. Um, and you can ask if you go into ethical and moral and debates, you can you can ask a lot of questions about it. But I think it also shows that at times when the context is quite complex, you also can have museums trying to be creative and find a solution for what they then believe is the good thing to do. Um, so just to add that that level. Thank you. Did you want to add something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, just to uh, kind of respond to the question of uh, how to involve the local community or the family of of, of the uh, of figures, important figures. Um, of course, we want to uh, we want um, return restitution to be as inclusive as as ever. Of course, that's the ideal uh, uh, statement, I guess. I guess from from us. Um, but I guess for for the Ponogoro case is is quite spatial in a sense that it it the position of Diponogoro within Indonesia is very spatial. It's, he had, he, he's a, he's a very much covered uh, national heroes and then uh, the 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 idea of, of of involving the family maybe not not there because the the state's already taking care of of Diponogoro quote unquote um, and it become very Inclusive process in the sense um, when I talk to the uh, former or the ambassador of, of the Indonesian ambassador for the Netherlands uh, for for this uh, case study uh, for the Greece. Um, so actually, the the museum in the Netherlands already uh, notified the Indonesian side or the Indonesian government through the ambassadors in the 2018. But then the ambassador at the time, uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, decided that. They will keep it a secret, even if within their own governments, because it precedes the 20, uh, eight, 2019 presidential elections. So they believe that if they uh, put it out, it will be used by political means for political means. So, so they just want to make it circuit after that. So they just uh, keep it by them, for themselves. But then only in the 2020, uh, they, they notified the Ministry of Cultures, which is their counterpart in, within the government. 
And when I spoke to the director of director general of of, of cultures, uh, he he said, and I quoted that they only involved in the eleventh hours of, of of this process of the return. So it's very exclusive. So, so uh, in the process of, of the Ponogoro. Um, why? I guess it came back to the to the to the position of the Ponogoro within Indonesia and maybe other object that will be returned to Indonesia could be more inclusive. I don't know. It looks very interesting. Uh, political involvement is always a bit of a problem, isn't it? And sometimes it's hard to avoid that. It, it brings up some interesting points just about when an object can become an item of national heritage. It can sort of become something of importance that then the state wants to get involved versus items that are maybe of more local interest or interest to a family, or even a very important family. So it brings up some of those tensions. Um, I think maybe now we'll, we'll open it up to questions. We have about just under 10 minutes. We'll start with questions from people who've braved the cold and the rain and made it here and see if they have any questions. We, ha we have quite a few coming in online as well. We'll try to address those as best we can. I think if anyone online doesn't have a chance to um, have their question responded to, maybe you could write it in an email and, and the various researchers will try their best to, to answer them. So first, anyone in the room, I think there's a microphone. So if you can wait for the microphone, ask your question into the microphone for our friends listening in at home, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank Maybe you. Maybe just for say, fantastic. introduce yourself briefly and then. Okay. Um, my name is Catherine Lacroix. I'm just finishing up a master's in heritage studies at Cambridge. And I'm writing a dissertation on corporate social responsibility with regards to um, how, I guess, uh, the production of copies or fakes can be used in restitution. Um, my question today is about the metrics of, of evaluating like the impact of, of, you know, the long afterlives, after afterlives, like we were saying at the start. Um, across your very different case studies with very different stakeholders of communities, of course, uh, where different um, cultural importance, uh, different sources of cultural importance are attached to these objects. Did you have um, a set kind of metrics across the project to evaluate um, the impact of the return or was it, were they developed? Were those metrics developed case by case? Um, so I guess more like what kind of you know, measurements are you using to to conduct uh, to conduct that impact research? Yeah, thank you. So that's a, that's an interesting question. I guess our um, we based uh, a lot of our of our research on, on qualitative research, right, on interviews, uh, and we had also because we we work with uh, with consultants, we had some some very set. Uh, questions to ask uh, all all of the stakeholders that 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 we approach to have a sort of comparison. I think it also goes back to the selection of the cases that we we did because it's it's a, a little bit exploratory, like I explained at the beginning. So we haven't found a lot of very similar uh, projects that had been done. So this is why we wanted to have sort of a, this broad lens. But we did pick uh, cases that had similarities and and. Um, points of comparison as well, like within them. So we're trying to uh, look at them um, all together, but also their specific case studies. For example, we have two of them that looked at objects that were belong to national heroes, for example, um, a couple that were returned, you know, more specifically to states, a couple that were, so, so they had also similarities. So I guess we are doing comparison like um, of all the the case studies as a whole, as well as, as to some kind of specific one. So this was, it was quite a complex complex matrix at the side to hopefully have have those kinds of uh, of, of finding um, that we can that each case study is not as unique as it may seem that they have some some comparison uh, through them. I, I think also, um, I mean, really evaluating. Um, kind of impact is, is difficult. Um, and I, I think ultimately what comes out is more kind of which parameters of the process led to really valuable results and which parameters led to 
very unexpected results, like, for instance, objects ending up in store, but the Indonesia case is not the only one. Um, and I think that's more the kind of impact that we're looking at because these objects, we try to find cases that can be cross-referenced to some extent. But on the other hand, there are also very different types of objects. If you return a, a spiritual object as opposed to an archival record collection, um, it's hard to, <laughs> to weigh them up against each other. So I think I think the, the results in terms of impact are are more kind of descriptive and linked to because we we focus on the afterlife, but also by looking very much at the process to which something was returned. And ideally it wasn't possible in all cases, but as much as possible also linked to which other processes were ongoing, like in the case of Germany and Namibia, all the decolonization, discussion on genocide and so on that was ongoing and how does that fit in? Um, so I think that's kind of broadly, I don't know if that answers your question. And for me, just said it's also a bit of a moving target because um, we're not going to say, well, now this is also the end of the story because it is continuing. And we were quite surprised that actually quite a few of the objects ended up in storage, but they may not be in storage in two years' time. So I think it's, it's still, um, you know, continuing, a story that's continuing and hoping that other people will continue that research as well. Great. Thank you. Um, question here. Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Murphy, from senior le lecturer at SOAS, um, also working on the same project as Panga. Um, yeah, I, I was really interested with um, your presentation. I, this is the first time I've seen an object returned that has actually then gone under worship. You know, you, I think in all of the Cambo Cambodian cases, for example, they've all gone back to museums and not even to, to the National Museum of Phnom Penh and not even, you know, site museums, not even that step. So it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so I was just wondering from the conservation point of view, or has there been any pushback then in, in terms of other Western museums then sort of being more hesitant to um, restitute Nepalese objects because they, you know, we've seen what's happened recently with the Benin bronzes and, and the fact that they're not going back to museums and going back to the the Oba. I was just wondering, has there been sort of any negative um, pushback um, from that? And maybe the Western Museum conservators need to start thinking about different methods of conservation, like indigenous methods. And even, I guess, from the sort of Southeast Asian examples, a lot of the conservators there are trained in the West. So they, they take back that Western bet, so-called best practice, which is really problematic because then, again, it just perpetuates um, so yeah, I was just wondering if there's more you've encountered on that. Um, I haven't spoken to all Western museums, but uh, <laughs> with Nepali collections. Um, but what I have found interesting so far is that there has been a real increase in the number of returns from the US, which I know was different from quite a lot of, because it's mainly private um, museums or, or university museums. Um, but there has been a real increase, um, which is also not what I had expected. Um, and I spoke to the American embassy um, and they were very much kind of pushing for this return because according to them, it showed how valuable these returns are for people. Um, I think it would be an interesting research topic to go around European museums with, <laughs> with the Bali objects and ask themselves the same question. Um, but just to, to expand a bit and also on the link with Cambodia, um, I did find, of course, if you talk to Nepali conservators, they've also been trained in the West and according to Western tradition. And you, you do see, I mean, some will ask questions about, yeah, but you know, we put the tikka powder and ultimately it will disintegrate the statues. But then most of them said, but you know what? These statues were made to be worshiped. So if that means that they'll gradually deteriorate, so what? This is, this is their purpose. Um, and what I found striking is that in Cambodia, I did not find that. Um, depending on which order I asked my questions in, if I started with asking questions about the spiritual value of the statues, they were all for the spiritual value. But then 
it had to be in the museum. <laughs> and if you started with the question about the museum, it was all about conservation. And then if you threw in a question about well, what about the worshiping, they were like, well, but this is this is of national importance. This is a national, it has to be in um. I didn't find that in Nepal. In Nepal, you also have the ones who've been educated in, in conservators who understand, but who still said, you know, the purpose of these that, and, and I think that domination of the living tradition, like you can conserve only one of the two, you conserve the living heritage or you conserve the material heritage. And if your living culture is alive, I, I mean, I found that Nepal for me was such an uplifting case because it is very different from all the other ones I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't even sure to what extent the Nepali themselves understood how different <laughs> their approach is. Like, I, I tried to tell them, you should go around and promote this <laughs> because I've seen a lot of countries struggling with what to do with spiritual objects. And for them, it was just like, well, I mean, these are gods, of course, they need to go back more or less, right? <laughs> I just wanted to add this. Um, so I haven't uh, done the research in detail with the, the Asian uh, cases, but I wanted to say something on a very interesting point about the role of museums and how they see themselves and should they change or not. Um, because I, I did show that the sticker, you know, some museums saying, well, we support repatriation. But actually, I had one museum professional, um, actually director of a museum, they have a lot of indigenous material. And what that person told me is that we're happy to return everything because it's not about objects, it's about stories. We're here to tell stories. We're here to share culture. So yeah, I think uh, there may be a whole uh, reconceptualization of what museums are as well in, uh, in those that have very different views of conservation, et cetera. In the past. Okay, well, I think we're, I think we're going to have to, we can continue the questions and answers maybe um, socially after the event. Well, thank you all for, for being a part of this. And thank you to Kristen, to Elka, to Panga, to Dino for, for teasing us with what you have in this uh, report. I want to ask the, the question of what your recommendations will look like, but I know the answer will be wait for the report. And we'll all have to be patient, but I think there's so much that's come out of this, even as a preliminary exposition that we can really think about and reflect on for the months ahead while we wait um, with bated breath for the, for the final recommendations. So as I mentioned, there were a number of questions that came in online. It was very hard for us to get to all of those in the allotted time. So I think the team is going to do their best to try to address those in, a, in another way, possibly by email. So anyone who signed up online, um, if, if you've left your email when you signed up, then those, those can be answered in, in that capacity. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So once again, thank you very much to the, the presenters for, for letting us in on your research and, and letting us know what lies ahead with the work you're doing. Very important work in this area. And with that, uh, thank you and enjoy the evening. <laughs>